Hi, and welcome to Audi TV, the podcast. The fascination of power meets the fascination of mobility. From the earliest days, the rulers of this world have required more than just a means of transport. Their coaches and carriages had to show off their importance and influence. Following extensive rebuilding work, the Audi Forum in Ingolstadt reopened on the 12th of March with a highlight that has never before been seen in Germany. Eleven majestic vehicles, from a Bronze Age chariot to the Pope Mobile used by Pope John Paul II and the latest armor-plated limousines. This special exhibition on the subject of pomp and circumstance shows state coaches and carriages of the great leaders through the ages. Here you can forget the Cold War. John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev stand close together, united by their magnificent automobiles. Starting on the 12th of March, the Audi Museum Mobile in Ingolstadt is holding a most unusual exhibition. Power and Splendor is the title, and it consists of a cavalcade of legendary state carriages of various kinds. Hans Dietrich Genscher was a guest of honor on the opening night, together with his faithful chauffeur. In an interview with news anchor Jan Hofer, Germany's former foreign minister Genscher knew to tell some stories of his own on the subject of state carriages. We were driving through the Eiffel Hills when suddenly we hit a patch of ice. It was January. The car rolled over two and a half times. It was one of the first armored cars, and you couldn't open the windows. Only the driver's window wound halfway down, but I wouldn't have fitted through it, not even now, let alone in those days. We managed to open one door and we crawled out, the driver and I. I'd broken my breastbone. We were both a bit the worse for wear. I stood beside the car in my shirt sleeves, feeling like the captain of a ship that's just been captured by the enemy. Then a woman came along and stopped. Suddenly, she saw the security man who was halfway through the door with a broken hand. The car was upside down and you could only see his legs sticking out. The good woman asked me, is he dead? No, I replied, he's on the phone. <laughs> well, nowadays it's nothing unusual to make phone calls in a car. But in those days, the average person had no idea it was even possible. And so she probably thought it wasn't just my breastbone, but I must have had a bang on the head as well. Ever since the wheel was invented, kings, princes and presidents have used carriages, coaches and later cars for more than just transport. Their vehicles also reflected their power and status, certainly their desire for respect and sometimes even a modicum of taste. This exhibition shows that the fascination with cars is as old as the wheel itself. The very first noble carriages didn't hold back when it came to projecting an image, and the early motor cars belonging to heads of state certainly couldn't be accused of understatement. For example, this Austro Daimler 920 HP. Stefan Felber of Audi Tradition is familiar with the stories and anecdotes behind all the pomp and circumstance. That wasn't quite as majestic an exit as the original owner of this car would have made. A famous name that I'm sure everyone knows, Emperor Franz Josef of Austria. Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany still believed in the horse. He said the automobile was only a temporary phenomenon, and Franz Josef took a similar view. So, to convince him of the usefulness of the modern motor car, the Austrian Automobile Club gave him a very special 80th birthday gift. They presented him with this car. And because driving was a complicated matter in those days, they threw in a driver as well. And as the emperor occasionally liked to puff at a cigar, just like previous German chancellor Gerhard Schröder, they installed the first electric cigar lighter for him. That was a very unusual feature and quite a technical achievement for the time. And I am probably also sitting in the first car with a telephone. I mean this little earpiece. It's basically the old speaking tube principle. If I blow down it and then speak, then my voice can be heard in the front seat. So the emperor was able to tell his chauffeur which way to turn. 
ähm, seinem, seinem ähm, Leibdiener vorne die Richtung vorzugeben. Und da der Kaiser mit 80 As the Emperor still had correspondence to attend to, even at the age of 80, the back seat got equipped with a little writing desk where he could keep his pen and writing paper. He was very short-sighted and they installed this clock with a magnifying glass so that he could read the time more easily. The highlights of the exhibition are probably the carriages of the Lords of the Cold War. The ZIL 111G, built in 1963, was the grand official car of no less a person than Nikita Khrushchev. The car is 20 foot long and the heaviest exhibit we've ever had in the museum. It weighs four tons and it isn't even armored. The cars were built over a period of 20 years and 12 of them are still in existence. This is one of the few in original condition. It's a nice touch that the Soviet leaders obviously looked up to public enemy number one, namely the United States. The car is basically nothing other than a copy of a Packard from the 1950s. It wasn't even a very good copy on the engineering side. The radiator grill, the rear view mirror and parts of the interior were just American spare parts readily available. So you could say that the Russian leaders traveled about in American automobiles. Its counterpart is a Lincoln Continental GG300, the model that John F. Kennedy drove. The presidential limousine was a specialist conversion commissioned by the American Secret Service for $200,000, a vast sum in those days. This car acquired its sad fame when the fatal shots were fired in Dallas on the 22nd of November 1963. John F. Kennedy was sitting in the back seat and the assassin's bullets killed him. Since then, the Lincoln Continental has been more a part of America's history than any other vehicle. A presidential radio. A president who also holds the reins of government needs to be in control of all the functions in his car as well. And it was obviously important to him which station he listened to. So the control panel is here in the back. There's a radio in the dashboard as usual, but it's only the receiver. The president himself decided which station was selected and what sort of music was played in the car. Now we come to the history of our own company. Here I am in the back seat of a Hawk 830BL, a very luxurious car, a sports cabriolet. In the 1930s, it was one of the most expensive cars in Germany. This car was built in 1936 for General von Kolditz, who was later supreme commander of the armed forces in Paris. He had orders from Adolf Hitler to raise the city to the ground during retreat. It was a very dramatic moment. The Eiffel Tower was already wired up with dynamite, but von Kolditz declined to give the command. He was so fond of Paris that he gave the order to retreat, but not to destroy the city. He had to abandon the car and it was seized by his opponent, General Charles de Gaulle, as war booty. The story goes that de Gaulle so respected von Kolditz's courageous refusal to obey Hitler's orders, that he took over the car as his own official transport, even though it had been made by his arch enemy, the Germans, and used it for parades and official functions until 1950. Power and splendor can be seen at the Museum Mobile in Ingolstadt until the 30th of June. The opening times are daily from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., except Good Friday. Thanks for watching this edition of Audi TV, the podcast.